Good morning, and welcome to Holy Cross Lutheran Church on this, the third Sunday in Lent. A reminder of God's grace and mercy is with us, even in our wayward and unrepentant self. We begin as we live in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A few announcements uh, before we continue. Uh, we celebrate with Bill and Mary Bemboom as uh, their granddaughter Kathleen Lucy Holloway was baptized yesterday. And we celebrate uh, the life of faith in that child and uh, give thanks for God's promise uh, to her and how she will continue to grow in the covenant of God's grace all her days. Uh, a reminder to you that we continue to give thanks uh, for your continued support throughout uh, the pandemic. Uh, it's important that we continue to uh, give to our regular general offering, but also if you are interested in providing uh, extra support for our Lenten charity giving, uh, which goes to support the Maple Lake Backpack Buddies program and the Buffalo Strong Fund, you can do that through three ways. First, you can use the purple envelopes in the envelope system. You can write Lenten offering in the memo. And uh, the third way is to use PushPay, our online uh, giving service. And so if you uh, would like to give to that, we encourage you to do so. Uh, we uh, have been having a great time with our Come to the Table series, an opportunity to gather with one other family or uh, others uh, as you read scripture together and to think about our series, Come to the Table. The online devotion is posted each Wednesday afternoon, and you can use it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, or maybe even on a Sunday uh, afternoon. We hope that you will take that in as an opportunity to meet the need of fellowship and grow in faith during this Lenten season. The last announcement that I have, uh, we're uh, now at the halfway mark of our Lenten season, and so we encourage you to be thinking ahead about how you might join us for worship during Holy Week. There will be two services on Palm Sunday. There will be three services offered on both Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. And then we will have our regular uh, services at uh, 630 8 and 9 30 on Easter morning and so we encourage you to uh, take a look at our sign up link and uh, think about that as we plan ahead for our observance of Holy Week this year. Those are all the announcements. I invite you to turn to page five in your online bulletin and join Jen and John as they sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. It is hymn number 448. <laughs>
bulletin. Let us pray. Father of mercies and God of all consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may attend to your word, confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. With nothing but the cross of Christ before us, we should acknowledge ourselves guilty of all kinds of sins, even those of which we are not aware, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. Likewise, we should confess those sins which we know and trouble us. Examine yourself in light of the Ten Commandments, whether as a parent or child, employee and neighbor. Consider whether you have been disobedient, unfaithful, lazy, angry, sexually unfaithful or quarrelsome, whether you have injured anyone by word or deed, stolen, neglected, or wasted anything, or done any other evil. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have failed to fear, love, and trust you above all else. We have used your name to curse, swear, and lie, rather than call on you in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. We have neglected your holy word and the preaching of it. We have despised authority and let our anger boil over. We have not lived lives of purity before you. We have hindered the well-being of our neighbors. We have spoken ill of those around us and have wrongly desired their property and all that is theirs. By the mercy of your Son and for his sake, we seek your forgiveness and ask for the abundance of your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and fellow minister of the Church of Christ, by his authority and in his stead, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of all mercy, by your power to heal and to forgive, graciously cleanse us from all sin and make us strong. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We turn our attention to God's Word. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost? until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he gathers together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, 
And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, when this son of yours comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus, amen. When it comes to my car keys, I am the most negligent, scatterbrained person who has ever lived on the face of the planet. I know that I should have a routine for my keys, a bowl, a hook, a singular place to put them. But a singular location to drop my keys does not exist. There are many places that I might set them down. On the makeshift office table that's currently in our family room, or on my dresser, on the intended hook in the top, at the top of the stairs, or any other place that I might put them, like the cup holder in my car, or the countertop, or the ledge, or the bench, or any other dumb place that my brain should say, that's a dumb place. Don't put those there. And it doesn't only happen at home. In fact, many of you have commented that I always have my keys in the door of my pastor's study. That's because at least then I know where they are. 
but I've been known to have misplaced them in this building too. It really is a hopeless situation. Of course, I don't know that I have lost my keys until it's time to leave. Usually it is when I'm running late and should already have been out the door. And then I'm just frantic. I'm an absolute crazy person flitting about the house or the church in panic as if some nuclear bomb is going to destroy the whole world if I don't find my keys in the next 20 seconds. And usually it's in the strangest of places, and in my outlandish state, I can't seem to think about those obvious places. But they're always right there in plain sight, just not in the usual place. If I would just take a moment to sit and think it through and retrace my steps, I could save myself the uncontrollable anxiety attack. But what fun would that be? then I would never know the relief of finding my keys. I must say, however, I very seldom feel the joy that's described in the parables. Rather, instead, embarrassment and shame floods in, usually muttering under my breath, Curtis, you're such a dunce. But the three parables in our gospel reading for today actually celebrate the joy and relief of finding the lost. In each of the parables, Jesus illustrates God's determined obsession and concern for the lost. A shepherd has a hundred sheep, but as he counts them, he discovers that one has wandered off from the flock. He leaves the 99, susceptible to their own wanderings, the attack of wolves or rival thieves, in search of that one. Of course, the sheep doesn't know that it's lost, but the shepherd did, and that was the sheep's only hope. The same thing with the coin. Like my keys, the coin is an inanimate object, and the only indication that it is lost is the woman who discovers that it's missing. The difference between her and me is that she's diligent and I'm just berserk. She lights a lamp in the same way that we might use our cell phone flashlight to look under the couch. She sweeps the dirt floor until the worn coin glints just a bit in the light. We may be tempted to celebrate the younger son in the third parable who recognizes just how far he's fallen, just how lost he really was. Although he came to himself and re rehearsed his little speech, the father doesn't seem interested in confessions or self-defense. He is just ready to welcome him home. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The scenes of this prodigal son and the fa prodigal father have inspired authors and artists. It has prompted repentance in the heart of sinners. And it's incited remarkable celebrations for homecomings of all sorts all of which are beautiful portrayals and powerful moments of self-discovery and redemptive love. But the first two, the first two parables, the first two scenes, they indicate a lack of awareness on the part of the lost and a determination by the owner who searches and finds the object of its search. So to focus on the younger son's repentance seems to miss the point. And for this reason, I'd like to turn our attention to the elder son for a moment. The elder son stayed home. He worked the property that was left. He lived in the presence of the father, and he knew that his portion and his future were secure. But as the party drags on from evening into night, it is the father who looked around and realized that his older son has not come in from the chores. 
there's the connection. He goes out to find the eldest son. That which is outside the father's celebration must be gathered in. What had been in plain sight all this time was a son who was lost, lost in his anger, his bitterness, resentment, and self-justification. Listen to his little speech. Look, these many years I have served you and I've never disobeyed your command. To which most of us would respond, oh really, never? Not once. And you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours comes home, did you notice that he can't say, this brother of mine, but rather, this son of yours? When this son of yours comes home, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. But Jesus doesn't seem to care about morality. Sheep and coins cannot be bad just because they're lost. Neither are sons, young and old, angry or relieved, prodigal or perfect. They are just lost, and they have no more ability to find the Father than a coin has to find its owner. Did the elder son ever go in, or did he run off in anger? Did the brothers ever reconcile? The parable is left unresolved. Well, what's the point of that? St. Luke, the Gospel writer, assumes that there are some Pharisees among his listeners, as there were the day that Jesus told these parables, and as there are here among us today. The point of the parable, I think, is to prompt self-examination and repentance among the Pharisees and older brother characters. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that Jesus is again sitting with tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees and scribes grumble as they look on. This man receives sinners and eats with them. No matter how selfless you think you are, there is probably a judgmental streak in each one of us too. On this side of heaven, no one is a saint without being a sinner too. Your judgments come out in your personal opinions, your commentary on the pandemic, and let's face it, your innate animal reflex for self-preservation. But self-righteousness in any form doesn't keep you from being lost. If you spend your days comparing yourself to others, you wander further from the fold, you roll deeper into the dark crevices, and you never get into the party. When you're busy celebrating your Pharisee superiority, God gets busy celebrating sinners with joy and love. And if you insist on being a Pharisee, on always being right, that means you don't sit at the table with Jesus. But that's the whole point, friends. Every one of us is lost. Every one of us is a sinner. Even those who claim to have their act together even you, even me. Whether by the fault of your stomach like sheep or the system that lets you slip through the cracks, whether you've squandered everything or you're too busy being too morally exceptional, you are lost. But the shepherd searches for the sheep. 
and the woman sweeps for the coin. And the father leaves the pardon to look for his elder son. And Jesus, Jesus came to earth to invite sinners and Pharisees alike to the banquet of the Lord. Thankfully, God is on an endless search for the lost, for the last, and the least. His love is obsessed with sinner saints. The shepherd of souls is looking for you. The light of Christ is revealing the hidden resentment that still resides in your heart. You need a loving father who hosts banquets for wayward sons and invites bitter brothers to come inside and experience the celebration of the father's love. Only this kind of determined, obsessive, risky love of the divine creates repentance and makes sinners worth saving. Repentance is the miracle of God's tireless grace that seeks real sinners to sit at his table. Only confessing sinners who know the, will know the joy and celebration of being found in the grace of God. It's unfair. It's offensive. But this, my friends, is how God operates. As one pastor theologian reminds us, in the kingdom of God, the only force which is more powerful than God's justice is God's mercy. Thanks be to God. Amen. We'll join together in singing our hymn of the day. O Christ, our light, O radiance true, it is hymn number 380.
Having heard the good news, we join together in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It is printed on pages three and four in your online bulletin. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's people according to their needs. O oh Lord, how extravagant your love, a love that will not let us go, a love that welcomes us even when we have run off, a love that shows us our sin and reveals your forgiveness anyway. Teach us, O oh Lord, to be your people, to be your daughters and sons, that we might seek you as a loving Father and receive your gift of grace always in our life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice with Kathleen Holloway as she has been baptized into the faith. Strengthen her in your word and give her your promises that her life may be guided by your grace all, our, all her days. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We remember all those who are in need of healing in mind, body, spirit, and relationship. Especially we remember those impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, especially Juan Fernandez, our missionary in Bolivia. We continue to remember the victims and those impacted by the tragic events at the Crossroads Clinic in Buffalo. Give healing to the wounded, comfort to those who are grieving, safe shelter to those who are scared and teach us to love each other. And we pray for those who are connected to our own congregation, especially this day we remember Eleanor, Heidi, Rose, and Joe, and those dealing with cancer, including Sandy and Jerry, Bob and Mike, Mary Jo and Joan. And we remember before you now the people we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts at this time. Send forth your power and presence, O God, that they might know your peace and healing in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with all those who walk through the valley of the shadow of death and those who grieve the death of loved ones. Especially today, we remember the family and friends of Otto Sebastian, the family and friends of Whitney Nelson, the family and friends of Paulette Carlson, and the family and friends of Mary Hubbard. Remind them that because the tomb is empty and Jesus lives, we too shall live in the glorious company of your saints in light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O most loving Father, you want us to give thanks for all things, to fear nothing except losing you, and to lay all our cares on you, knowing that you indeed care for us. Grant that no clouds in this mortal life may hide from us the light of your immortal love shown to us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in singing our Lenten hymn number 98, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. It is also printed on page 7 in your online bulletin. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes who will condemn him to death. And they will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and scourge him, and finally they will crucify him. But on the third day, he will rise. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. 